Those of you who are subscribed to my YouTube channel and following it probably know that there is a fundraising campaign going on right now to help me acquire a new MacBook Pro laptop. My old workhorse, my laptop, my MacBook Pro uh, died about a week and a half ago and I really don't have the resources to myself right now to, uh, to replace it with a comparable unit. So a couple of my friends got together and they started a GoFundMe page to help me out. They saw, you know, they observed the stress, <laughs> the panic <laughs> that I was uh, engaged in and they said they would help out. Um, they said just leave it to us. So they started fundraising through this GoFundMe and they and they were doing it on Facebook and they raised almost a thousand dollars on Facebook of the three thousand that's needed to buy an actual comparable um, computer. And then things petered off and they asked whether I would put up a, a video on YouTube about it and I did that. Um, and what I offered in the in the video that I did on YouTube is that anybody that's willing to donate at least twenty dollars I would be willing to make produce a video um, responding to questions or topics that you think um, you'd like to hear my my viewpoints on or that you think I might have some knowledge about so I did one of those videos one of those response videos yesterday about a couple of sacred sites here in West Lethbridge and today I'm prepared now to do another one of those videos. And this one comes from a gentleman named uh, Michael, who would like to know more about Derek. Derek is my pet magpie, uh, who I've had about seven or eight years now. And I'm actually standing in the place very close to where I acquired Derek as a pet um, in this patch of, of bullberries here and I'm, I'm gonna show you uh, very soon his his actual natal nest how it looks today but this is a this is a special place to me and it's a special place to me because of Derek Derek has been uh, a life changer for me and the story of Derek really begins almost before his birth. Um, in the late winter, before his birth, my wife and I and um, our in-law, uh, the late Narcissus Blood, um, and Alvin Mountain Horse, uh, we went to we went on a business trip to Scotland. England and France um, we were involved in some repatriation related conversations over there opening the gateway for um, museums in the United Kingdom to start giving back the sacred items that they took from the Blackfoot tribes over here and while we were over there um, we think it was in Aberdeen Mahoney, my wife, uh, got pregnant. We didn't, we didn't know it, of course, in the instant. Um, we've been married a long time. Like Now we've been married 20 years. I think then we've been married 12 or 13 years. And um, she got pregnant. This would be her first pregnancy from me. Um, she had got pregnant once before when she was a young young girl really um, and our daughter you know who who I've raised since the time she was three or four years old is now 25 years old uh, but we never had any children ourselves the, the two of us and we really didn't think it could happen at all, um, actually, because Mahoney also has a very severe kind of rheumatoid arthritis, and she's on some heavy drugs, and they basically um, kick pregnancies out of your system. Um, even, even before she got the arthritis, 
you know, when Justine, when our daughter was born, she was two and a half pounds. She was lucky she even survived. And Mahoney was in the hospital for, I think, two months uh, because her body just became septic with the pregnancy. So we didn't think it could ever happen, but she got, she got pregnant. We didn't know it. And then um, it was an ectopic pregnancy. So it was up in her fallopian tube. And, of course, that's very problematic. And eventually that problem surfaced. And so um, we had to have the pregnancy removed. And, um, and then she was, at that point, had her tubes tied so that she won't get pregnant again because it's actually pretty dangerous for her to get pregnant with the kind of drugs. In general, it's dangerous for her. But it's especially dangerous with the with the drugs that she's taken because there can be a lot of birth defects and such. But we were <clears throat> we were very sad um, at the loss, all the same. In, unless you've been through it, it's hard to imagine that you know you would feel so much loss for a child that you never had <laughs> but <clears throat> that's the way we felt so after that experience going into the summer I think we wanted to take care of something we wanted a baby Maybe not a human baby, but some something to replace, something to take care of. And <clears throat> we were visiting out here um, at the at the wetlands every night. We were spending hours out here just watching the wildlife every night. And we started talking about adopting a pet magpie. And the reason that we that we chose that is because. There is a Blackfoot tradition, there, well, for a couple of different things. First of all, the corvids, the crows, the ravens, the magpies um, were Blackfoot hunting partners in the past. And they, they were close allies. You know, when Lewis and Clark came through Blackfoot territory, they wrote in their journals about how the magpies would walk into their tents like they belonged there and eat from their hands. So that tells you something about what the relationship was here between the people and those birds um, before colonization. The colonization came in, it brought with it a demonization of all the synanthropic species, the ones that live with people, including, of course, the crows and the magpies. But in the past, they were the pets. In fact, there are stories that tell that the, the magpies were the pets of women, the crows were the pets of men, and at one time in the really ancient past, there was different camps, men's and women, and the women's camp had magpies and the men's had crows. Um, and I've seen photographs from turn of the century when people were still living in the teepees um, where uh, people would have these kind of ball-shaped, large ball-shaped um, bird cages of a sort made from willows with magpies, with their pet magpies in them. So we started talking about getting a magpie for that reason, because it was part of Blackfoot tradition to, to have them. But also because it's also a part of Blackfoot tradition that you can, you can gain a spiritual gift from a species if you help its, its young, its hatchlings, especially with birds, right? If you take a young bird, a young hatchling from a nest, and you raise it to adulthood, you have effectively brought it through the most dangerous period of its life. And what, you know, what we were going by was what some of the elders were saying way back at the turn of the century um, that we have field notes about from ethnographers that came out here and the elders told them yeah you take a take a young bird and you raise it to be an adult and then you set it free and when you set it free 
it's going to come back to you and it's going to teach you. It's going to bring you gifts, knowledge. Um, in fact, there's a, there was a little rawhide um, uh, string that you'd put around their, their leg so that you'd recognize them again. Almost like a contemporary bird band, hey? Um, so we thought we would take a baby magpie and we would raise it to adulthood and we would set it free and we would gain a spiritual gift and we would get the experience of taking care of something that we, that we wanted, right? We wanted that experience of, uh, of taking care of a baby. So there was a nest here. I'm going to show you the nest in a minute. There's a nest here in, the, in these bushes <clears throat> that, uh, that a magpie mother had laid some eggs in that year. And um, I watched it from the time she laid the eggs all the way to the time that we took Derek out of that nest. Derek was our, is our only bird that we've had that, that was not a rescue bird, that was a bird that was acquired on purpose. So we took him out of the nest. Um, I think before I get to that part of the story, I'm going to take you in here. But there's this place, because of Derek, has become very special to us. And so it's a place where we leave offerings. And... Um, when I climb back in there, you're going to see there are some offerings that I've left, uh, some of my clothes that were worn out that I, I I'm giving back. <laughs> Sorry. I knew this this video with the uh, with the topic was going to get pretty personal, so I'm trying to hold it together, but. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you'll see that there's clothes that I've put in there, and there's uh, there's the remains of our pet dog. Um. <laughs> it's just going there. You gotta crawl in to access it. <sighs> Ouch. A little thorn in my toe. Yeah, so there you can see there's my uh, some of my old uniforms, <laughs> my camouflage shorts, and this is this is some of the remains of um, our pet Chihuahua Dottie we had for like 14 or 15 years. Years. Dottie's old blanket right here that she was uh, set out here with. And up right up there above me, that little bundle of sticks there, is the what's left of the nest that Derek was born in. And uh, when he was... When he was originally hatched, I think he had three siblings in there. I got a photograph, so I'll, I'll show you that photograph. Yeah, he had three siblings or four siblings, I'm not sure. And uh, they were all just naked old men in there. <laughs> That's how they look. They look like... Uh, Gollum <laughs> in that nest um, but I I had in mind that we would take one of one of them one of them away when it was time you know when they'd grown up a little bit older now his mom Derek's mom still nests here she's using this nest now this one up here she still nests here every year 
That year that uh, Derek was here, as a, as we watched, you know, every every week or so, I'd kind of crawl in here and take a look, and <clears throat> um, his siblings started to disappear one by one. You know, uh, a predator was getting to them. And this is exactly the thing, right? Summer is the feast of babies. I've said this in several videos. Summer is when uh, when you're going to have everybody, everybody's eating the babies and the unborn. And so one by one, these babies in this nest were being picked off until there were uh, just two. One day I came to look in here, there were just two. And they weren't quite fledgling size yet. They were still hatchling, but they were getting close, you know. They had some pin feathers and stuff going on. But they, they weren't quite uh, fledgling size quite yet. But I decided that rather than wait for them to get eaten by the predator that had been visiting as well, I would take one of them away. And so I put Derek into my pocket, my hoodie pocket. I was wearing a hoodie. And uh, we took him home. And for the next two weeks, he sat on Mahoney's chest. Um, she just stayed home, put a blanket on her chest. In fact, it might even be this blanket that, uh, that we left Dottie here with. This blue blanket. She put this blanket on her chest. And uh, she had Derek laying there. And he would wake up only when he needed to eat or poop. <laughs> so he'd wake up. He'd be, he'd be crying for food. She'd feed him. And, um, and then he'd take like a couple of steps backward off the area that he laid. And he'd do a poop. And the poop was still in the... When baby birds poop, there's a technical name for it, but it's in kind of a membrane case so that you can just grab it and take it away. Um, so it was still in that phase. So for two weeks, just all day long, she sat with Derek and raised him. And um, raised him to fledge. And then once he fledged... Um, you know, it was very exciting times for us. He was getting to know us, we were getting to know him, and um, we were showing it off on all of our social media and stuff. And we were learning a lot about birds just by being around him every day. But we all, he was, by that time even, you know, three, four weeks into it, into the relationship, he was becoming so... Um, imprinted on us that we wondered what would happen when we let him go. Like, what if he flies and lands on somebody's shoulder and the majority of people around here hate magpies? I don't know why. Well, I do know why. It's, it's like part of their death complex. Uh, they've got a real... The mainstream culture has some real problem with death. And, um, and the corvids, the crows and the magpies are associated with it because they'll eat the dead. But in any case, it's carried over just to, to become now just a blind hatred. Anytime there's a there's a magpie, oh, we got to chase them away. We hate them. We hate the magpies. We hate the noise that they make. We hate having them around. And um, so we feared for him. We started fearing for him. And then at, at one point we just decided we can't we can't let him go because if we let him go, something bad's going to happen to him. He's either going to get run over by a car. Um, because a lot of them do get run over by cars in general.
but even more so, we thought, because he wasn't trained by his mom yet to avoid cars, and we couldn't provide that training for him. And, you know, the general fear that he would go and land on somebody um, because he's identifying with people, and that person would hurt him. So we decided we, we couldn't let him go. In the contemporary context, we couldn't do that. We couldn't actually fulfill that, like, that Blackfoot tradition. We couldn't, we couldn't play it out that way. We had to uh, actually just retain him as a pet. So that's what we did. We retained him. And let's crawl out of here and then I'll, I'll finish this video. Yeah, so we decided to retain Derek as a pet for his safety. We just, we knew that we just couldn't practice that Blackfoot tradition in this current sociocultural context and have him be safe, right? The whole point of the tradition is to is to raise them through the dangerous part of their life. And then they're going to repay you because they're going to know you and they're going to come back to you. And you're going to have an animal familiar and you're going to learn from them. But it doesn't do any good to raise them through that dangerous period in nature and then throw them into uh, into a human cultural danger right and we are still unfortunately in a context where people hate animals they hate like they really hate <laughs> not everybody but there's a lot of people that do hate those birds and aside from that when people are driving and they see birds magpies and crows on the road a lot of people are still of that mind frame that they better get out of the way. You know, if they're not smart enough to get out of the way, they don't deserve to live. So it was way too dangerous to like set him out into that world, this bird who we had invested so much into already. Um, this is probably one of Derek's relatives right now. <laughs> um, so we kept him kept him and of course very soon the other birds in the neighborhood noticed that there's a magpie living in our home and so they started to come visit um, they started to come look in the windows to see what was going on to try to understand what was happening here you know I've, I've since come to the realization <coughs> that um, the magpies and several other kind of synanthropic species, the species that are close to us as human beings, they're waiting for us, I think, to start acting human again. And when we do, you know, they'll embrace it. But they're afraid of us right now, and for good reason, because we're, we're a little crazy right now. <laughs> oh, what's up? We're, we're not right. So... They started looking in our windows and paying attention to us. And, uh, you know, we carried on with our lives with Derek. And and we were learning a lot from him, right? Um, by just living with him and taking care of him. Um, he was teaching us a lot. Coming into the second summer, the birds who had become so familiar with us by looking in the window, um, they, they had their broods the year after Derek was born, and they decided, some of them decided to bring their babies to us um, in our backyard and leave them with us while they went off to, uh, to gather food for them. 
And so because they're, because we had Derek with us, their babies saw Derek on us. And so they naturally just started um, being very close to us, uh, these wild magpies of the neighborhood. Um, they would land on us and they would uh, <laughs> experiment really themselves with this, you know, weird relationship with the peoples. And we would feed them, right? My landlord at the time um, eventually learned of this from neighbors and was really upset about it and would accuse me of, of baiting birds <laughs> to become my bird's companion and this kind of a thing. It's not really what was going on there. Um, but it was just a natural progression, right, where uh, Derek was, was, living with Derek was leading us into a closer relationship with that species. He, we were still uh, getting the gifts, the knowledge gifts that we would have got had we released him, um, but we were, we didn't have to release him to get there. I got burrs all over me. <laughs> kind of freaked me out when I first felt him there. Um, yeah, we were still getting those knowledge gifts, and we still are today. We had one bird that uh, was very, very fond of Derek, might have made a mate of him had we not ha been forced to move. We were forced to move ultimately because of birds. Um, because our neighbors hated birds so much and complained and our, and our landlord came over and saw birds and thought we were ruining his property and this kind of a thing and so it was all for the better though because ultimately um, we bought our own place I hope that wind isn't making too much of a racket we bought our own place ultimately and um, so now we don't have that problem, right? But uh, at the time we did. Derek had this one friend that we named Tawny. Tawny, like I say, might have become his mate. And uh, Tawny would come over to visit and walk right into our house. Like he would be at the window. We'd see him. We'd go, oh, Tawny, hold on. We'll open the door. I'll open the door. And he'd walk right in come he'd hang out with Derek for a little while he'd have some stuff to eat you know he knew where we kept the, the foods and the dog food and such and, uh, and then he'd go on his way his way there was a there was a day when I was working on a vehicle on our, our on our vehicle out on the drive pad and I was underneath the vehicle and I was kind of motionless underneath there and just my legs were sticking out and Tawny came along and saw me under there and just panicked like full out magpie alarm calls thinking that I was hurt um, that's the the kind of relationship that we were forming with wild birds there was a uh, there was a afternoon um, there was an incident where I picked up a snow goose um, that was injured, had a broken leg, and I, we brought her home and just healed her up, and she flew away from our backyard. But when I, the first day I brought her home, I had her, <clears throat> I was holding on to her, and I uh, was going to take a selfie, <laughs> and Tawny came and sat on my head. <laughs> looking down what do you got um, you know so that was one of the things when we moved from that house one of the painful things was we have to leave the birds that have come to know us so much you know we get a chance now in our new place where we've been living for the last two years to uh, to build new relationships but even at that you know from the last experience, I'm so scared. I'm so scared to pursue <laughs> those kind of relationships at our house because because of what what uh, the you know the the people are like, right? So I don't know our neighbors 
would probably like some of them would probably react negatively so I don't I try not to draw attention to us anymore like that right so uh, even though I I do um, offer food to the to birds in my backyard um, I try not to get close to them anymore because because of uh, I don't want anything you know I don't want any intrusions on our life happening because of neighbors who have that sick system in their head, you know? So, yeah, so now we're at a point where uh, two years ago, and, and from Derek, we've learned a lot, right? We've learned like the whole annual cycle of, you know, magpie's life. Um, the ups and downs of their hormones. Uh, Derek gets very, very hormonal <laughs> when it comes to her breeding time. And Derek turns out to be a girl. Two years ago, Derek started laying eggs. <laughs> um, I've got some of Derek's eggs kept away in a, in a, uh, in one of our china cabinets um, on display but yeah Derek Derek is a girl but we haven't changed his uh, gender pronoun or anything um, we're not pulling a Bruce Jenner with him we're just sticking with with calling him Derek and calling him he because that's what he's used to and I don't think we need to change that but he is a female we've learned um, you know, also from Derek and from working with the um, with the wild magpies at our at our previous residence, um, you know, they've they've taught me a lot of like their body language as well as their verbal language. I've learned a lot of that. So now when I'm out here at Spobikimi, um, when I hear magpies talking, calling, often I have some sense of of what is going on and whether I need to uh, go and check in on it. Um, you know, the magpies out here have been able to teach me more as a result of my, you know, living with Derek because I'm more attentive um, to that language, right, to what they're saying. And when there's events going on, um, they'll inevitably cue me off to that event and uh, I can go and see, you know, whatever insect happens to be hatching or whatever thing is dead. Or even, you know, they'll alert me to if there's a deer hiding in a particular bush, they'll tell me where that is, right? Again, because they want us to be human, right? They want to be our hunting partners again. Um, but, but culturally, socially, we're, we're not there right now. And, you know, I think we can get back to that in a way that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to leave behind our technologies or anything, but I think we can get back to our alliance with these animals um, that they're waiting for. And so Derek has become in a way a, a, a big experiment for us, but he's also at the same time, you know, he remains like, like any close family pet um, he remains a member of our family now, right? So, and uh, he's he's still very fond of me. One of the <laughs> one of the things going on right now with this laptop missing is that I I can't sit where I used to sit and work on my laptop, and Derek would sit on me, you know, sit on my shoulder or sit on my legs while I'm working. Now I have to go and, uh, and use a borrowed computer in another space and that, that Derek time isn't there. So I do really, really appreciate the, uh, the contribution and I hope that I've done something to, to answer your question uh, regarding wanting to know more about Derek. Um, thanks again. And here is what Derek is doing this afternoon. He is standing at the window 
watching outside because today there are a bunch of cottony seeds in the air. Hey mister? You looking at the seeds? Uh-huh. It's pretty exciting all those seeds flying through the air. Can I get in your bath? Take your splashy. Take your splashy. Get in there. Get your feathers clean. Yeah, get in there. You need to be clean. Yeah, you haven't taken a bath in a couple of days. Let's get it on. Mm -hmm. Get in there and get clean. Hop in there. Hop in there, get clean. I know you want to. It's nice and cool. Refreshing. Refreshing bath. Get in there. YouTube is waiting for you. Don't be shy. It'll only be cold at first. There you go. Get clean. Get your splashy on. Oh, so clean, huh? Yeah. Splash in the head. Get your feathers. I get your feathers too, mister. Not just your face. Get in there. Get your feathers. Big splash. Come on. Let's give us a big splash. Yeah. Give us the big splash. Oh my goodness. Get it up on your back. Put those wings in there. That doesn't even count yet. <laughs>